Good morning. We'd like to invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 2. And so um, this morning we'll uh, look at a very familiar passage, probably the most familiar passage of all time in all the Bible, I would think. The story of the incarnation, of the birth of Christ. So obviously we're very familiar with it, but hopefully I can provide some uh, some insights that we haven't thought about before. And if nothing else, we can just be more thankful this year because there's so many distractions when we think about Christ, uh, Christmas. It amazes me, actually, as I, I think about Christmas. Every year, I'm amazed by several things. First of all, first of all that um, Christmas is almost here. It's like it, it goes by so fast every year. It's just hard to believe. Time goes, especially as you get older, especially as you see your kids growing and growing um, Christmas comes fast. Also, I'm amazed by just how popular Christmas is all over the world. It is incredible. Um, I think about some of my friends I've had who were f- from overseas, and uh, they celebrated Christmas, and they, they didn't even believe in Jesus or God or the Bible, but they like giving each other gifts, so they celebrate Christmas. And so we see it a lot here, obviously. Um, I'm amazed at how quickly the Christmas things come up. When you go to the stores, like right away, they're just they're there, right there. The decorations, it's incredible. Um, it's amazing how many Christmas songs there are that are not about Jesus, right, Gene? <laughs> I mean, a lot of Christmas songs out there. And uh, I really am amazed, and I think this is, this is really neat, how um, sometimes we'll hear on the, like when we're out shopping or out in stores, wherever, we'll hear a Christmas song like, Oh, Holy Night or Silent Night, being sung by a pagan, someone who could care less about God, who doesn't believe in God, and yet they're singing these songs to praise God and, and that, that worship Him, that bring Him glory. And that's, I think that's really neat. I think it's kind of funny, kind of ironic, I guess. So negatives of Christmas, though, of course, as I've said, all the distractions with Christmas, so many things uh, that take the place. I mean, we, there's actually, if you drive out, take a right, there's a sign right there, by a house that says, Jesus is the reason for the season. And it's something we try to say, but it is so true. It's so easy for people to forget why we celebrate. And of course, with all those uh, secular Christmas songs, all those secular themes, all those Hallmark movies, ladies, right? <laughs> Men, maybe too. Um, it's this Christmas message that uh, the, the fake one, the, the good feelings, the warm fuzzies that people get, uh, the Christmas spirit. I mean, those are things that we that amazed me that I see a lot in the world. And then one thing in particular I wanted to point out this morning, morning, just by way of introduction, um, the way time is centered around Christ's birth is incredible. It just truly is amazing. So we right now are living 20, 21, what is it, AD. And then there's also BC. So BC means before Christ. AD is, we would think maybe after death, it's not. It's actually uh, in the year of our Lord. It's a Latin phrase. I think it says Anno Domini. Domini? I don't know. It's something like that. But either way. Um, so you, it's amazing to think about, though, that, that the time, the years, they're all um, structured around the birth of Christ. And so this was a system that actually came into being a few centuries after Christ was born. And so it really is incredible and so it's fitting, so it's a quote, that Jesus Christ is the separation of the old and the new. Um, B.C. was before Christ, and since his birth, we have been living in the year of our Lord. It's just incredible. Um, I went to school, to a liberal arts college, and I did art. Uh, hit, uh, I had to take some art history torture classes. I mean, art history classes. And uh, I, <laughs> you know what I think about art history, by the way. And so they changed it from, um, instead of B.C. and A.D., they would say B.C.E. and C.E. And so another quote, um, this is before common era and common era. And really the idea behind changing it <clears throat> was it was to um, prevent any religious connotation, um, to prevent offending other cultures and religions who, no, who may not see Jesus as Lord. So let's change it to A, whatever, A, B, C, E, and C, E. And then the quote continues. The irony, of course, is that what distinguishes B, C, E from C, E is still the life, 
and times of Jesus Christ. So you can change the name, but it's still centered around his birth. It's incredible. Um, there's a field of study as Christians called apologetics, and that is basically um, there are people who are apologists, and, and they just spend their time trying to defend the faith to show why Christianity is correct, because there are other religions in the world, and why is Christianity the right one? And so this, I think, is a good evidence to use that all of time is centered around it. It's incredible. So just a little bit of intro there about that. I, thought, I was, had thought about that this past year. It's just, it's just really amazing. It's, I think it's something we take for granted. So now let's look at the Luke uh, chapter 2. And of course, as I said, this is very familiar. So I'll try to draw out just some observations, some things I learned as I was studying. And hopefully this can be of help to all of you to be just even more thankful for the incarnation, for the birth of Christ. So chapter 2, verse 1 says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went out to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of the eight days, when, Jesus, or when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for this time to gather together, to spend in your word, and we are especially grateful for the incarnation, for Christmas, the, the real reason for the season for the birth of Christ. And we do confess it's easy to get distracted with so many other things, especially in the time and place we live in. Help us to put our focus on you. Help us to be thankful for Christmas, that God became man and dwelt among us. And we just pray you bless our time as we look at your word. And all these things we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's look first at uh, verse one. And this really gives us that timing of the events that happens. You, you basically see here as you look at this account, kind of the big picture of what's going on in world history and it zooms in to what happened with Joseph and Mary and then it gives us the birth and then the shepherds. So that, those are the, the outline for this morning. So it says it came about that the decree went from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. So in those days, what days? Well, this, these are just around the time John the Baptist had just been born. Um, we think, I mean, from what I've read at least, maybe uh, 4 to 6 BC is the timing of this era when this happened. Um, it says here Caesar Augustus, so he was the king of the Roman Empire. It says the entire world should be registered. So the, that word there is just speaking of the entire known world at the time, which was the Roman Empire. So that term is used quite a bit to refer to that. 
So all the world, and then this, this decree was made. So this official dogma, this statement, um, to be registered would just be to be numbered. It's basically a census. And they were going to count the people, find out how many people were there. And this was done every 14 years. And so uh, one of the main reasons that he would have done this was to get some money, right? Everything's about money. Find out how many people are there, and then they can tax them correctly. Uh, the other part of this was also for the army, just so they can know, um, make sure everyone was serving. And so then it says on uh, verse 2, this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. So this kind of gives us a little insight into the author, Luke. So Luke was the author, obviously, of this book, Luke and Acts, and Luke writes a lot of the Bible. You know, Luke and Acts are very long accounts. And Luke also was a very close associate with Paul. And so Luke, not only was he um, an author here, he was a historian, and he was also a doctor. And so he was very detailed. And what he was providing in this gospel, along with all the other gospels, was an eyewitness testimony of what happened. So if you just look back for a moment at Luke 1, verse 1, maybe flip a page. He describes just his approach to writing this gospel. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as, as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. So Luke basically gives there just a summary that, uh, you know, he, he had looked into these things very closely. And so here, this um, detail about Quirinius, governor of Syria, is a specific thing he mentions. And there is actually, just looking at this verse, there's actually a lot of commentary, a lot of ink spilt on this verse. And what's significant about it is it helps us to provide, it helps provide us the timing of when Jesus was born. And so there are um, differing views. I'm not going to go through the whole argument. I would recommend if you have John MacArthur's study Bible, the, his footnote's very good, extended note for this verse. So summary of what was happening here was this census was given every 14 years. And so more than likely from what we see of secular history, it was actually given the command that make the census was in 8 B.C., but that doesn't fit well when Christ was born, they think, uh, 6 to 4 B.C. So they're thinking maybe it was given, but then it was actually implemented a few years later. So that would provide an explanation of what was going on here. But I think the big idea, big picture here, is it just is helping us to identify um, about when Christ was born. So unfortunately, bad news, if you don't know this already, Jesus probably wasn't born on December 25th. Hate to break it to you, right? And uh, as we'll see later, um, the shepherds were out at night, so they think maybe it was actually earlier. I even heard some say maybe it was in Easter he was born. They think that maybe the two were swapped. I don't know. We don't know. Um, what we know for sure is that um, a few centuries after this happened, the Roman Catholic Church, they wanted to um, kind of change things because people were worshiping the winter solstice. It was very pagan. And so they said, hey, let's make this uh, date to worship Christ and said, and maybe then we could put the focus back on Christ. And unfortunately, what we got from that is a bit of a, a blending of everything, which is why we have so many different traditions nowadays um, with Christmas that have completely nothing to do with the birth of Christ. I'm not saying I'm against Christmas, by the way, on December 25th. I think it's great. I love it. It's my favorite holiday. I love it. But just a little bit of the history behind it. And so I think for any of these holidays, let's focus on Christ, and, and that's great. So... Verse 3, all went to be registered, each to his own town. So this was a worldwide registration. And so I guess unlike here, you know, I think recently we had a census and I had to fill out some information here. Um, at this time, they had to go back to their hometown where they're from to be registered. And it's very interesting in light of the prophecy in Micah, and we'll talk about that in a moment, how Micah said that the Savior would come from Bethlehem. So verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. 
So you see here, what's just incredible is God's providence. It's just, it amazes me. Um, God uses this pagan king's decree who wants money, who's greedy, and he uses that as a way to get Joseph and Mary back to Bethlehem to fulfill his prophecy given several hundred years before. I think it was from like 500 something years ago. So that's, that's really just incredible. And so it says here, uh, Joseph and Mary, and they probably were teenagers, by the way, um, youngsters, and they were from Nazareth. And so they had to go back then to Bethlehem. This probably would have been about three day, a three-day journey over 75 miles. And just imagine, ladies especially, you're about to have a baby and you're traveling three days, um, over maybe almost 90 miles. And so that wouldn't be a fun journey there. Also, just kind of amazing to think about how quickly we get places uh, 90 miles. It doesn't take three days. So a three-day journey. And then it also mentions Bethlehem. So Bethlehem, obviously a very significant place in the Bible. Not just the birth of Christ, but it was also just his name. Bethlehem means the house of bread. Think about it. Jesus, the bread of life being born in Bethlehem. is kind of neat. Uh, this is where the death of Rachel happened, the birth of Benjamin. And then Ruth, the book of Ruth, the events in Ruth take place in Bethlehem. I was reading it recently, just randomly, and I thought, oh, there's Bethlehem. I didn't even think about it. But it makes sense because from Ruth, um, you have Boaz and Ruth, who had Obed, who had Jesse, who had David. So there, and of course, then First and Second Samuel are all about David, and he was from Bethlehem. So here's the Micah 5.2 prophecy. It says, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathath, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, it says, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. So you have there a prophecy then of the importance of Bethlehem. And so notice also what it says about Joseph. It says he was of the lineage of David. So Joseph's line went back to David. His dad, his dad, his dad, all the way back to David. And then also Mary is believed that Mary's line went back as well because you have two genealogies, one in Matthew and one in Luke. So different lines both going back to David. And so what it showed then was with him being the son of Joseph, he wasn't the literal son of Joseph, obviously, the virgin birth, but he was the adopted son. And so they would see then Jesus as having the legal right to the throne, the right to reign. And then he also had the birth of um, coming from Mary. So in both ways, he was qualified, if you will, to be the Messiah. And so it says here, Mary came with him. Um, it could be that she came also to be registered. We're not sure. It can go either way. Or just because she's about to have a baby. She needs some help. She was going with her man, right? Back, to, back home. And it says betrothed. And so in, uh, in Matthew, we're told they were married. And we find out that actually the wedding... The marriage wasn't consummate, consummated until after the birth of the child, which fulfilled another prophecy. In Isaiah, the virgin will be, give birth to his son. So it, as we think about just this first section, it, it really is amazing, um, the idea of God's providence, how he was orchestrating events to make things happen. And yet um, these people seem to be acting of their own volition. So I'm going to talk just for a moment about providence um, so here's a definition I found helpful. God in, in eternity past in the counsel of his own will ordained everything that will happen. Yet in no sense is God the author of sin, nor is human responsibility removed. So that's kind of, a, I think, a good summary of providence. God orchestrating these events to happen. And so he, God making this prophecy that a virgin would give birth to a son. It would happen in Bethlehem. Then you have this king making these decrees that forced Joseph and Mary to go back to Bethlehem right at the time when she's about to have a child. It just is incredible to think about God's hand at work. And I'm sure all of you can think about ways God has worked in your lives, the providential hand of God. And it's the kind of thing you see later on as you look back, you see, oh, okay, I see why that happened. I see why, I see how God was at work now, here's a quote from uh, John MacArthur. It says, there are two ways God can act in the world, by miracle and by providence. A miracle has no natural explanation. In the flow of normal life, God norm suddenly stems the tide and injects a miracle. 
He then sets the flow back in motion, just like parting the Red Sea until his people could walk across and closing it up again. Do you think it would be easier to do that, to say, hold it, I want to do this miracle, and to do it, or to say, let's see, I've got 50 billion circumstances to orchestrate to accomplish this one thing. The latter is providence. So um, that's, I think, a good illustration. Um, You can think about turning the water into wine as a quick miracle, but then to think about God's providence. Um, A few examples would be like Joseph in the Bible. I mean, you you look at this story, Joseph in Old Testament and Genesis. um, You look at the story and the brothers are jealous. They sell him to slavery. And then in the end of it all, God uses him in Egypt to save the whole world. And then Joseph says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And so that's, it's amazing. Uh, Judas, another example. Judas was jealous. He was upset with Jesus. He sold him out for the pieces of silver as a slave. And then it says that it was ordained that he do that. And then it says, woe to the man who does that. And so you see there both sides of God's um, providence, his sovereignty at work, but then also man's responsibility as well. So I think uh, maybe something you haven't thought about before, just with the Christmas story, just the providence of God at work. It really is incredible. So now let's look at the birth of Jesus, verse 6. It says, while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. So while they were in Bethlehem, and she gave birth to her first son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there were no place for them in the end. So it's a very brief Description, it really doesn't go into much detail. It just says they were there and she gave birth. Um, so um, it does kind of remind me of the, the song, Away in the Manger. I thought I told Perry, I'd point this out this morning. Um, you have that lyric, uh, no crying he made. And um, so quick, funny story. My daughter, Brianna, was singing that the other day, yesterday. And Amber said, wait, he didn't cry? And she said, of course he didn't cry, Amber. And she had a very, um, of course not, he didn't cry. Well, I had to share the bad news with Brianna and Amber. I think he probably cried because um, he was a baby and um, babies cry when they're hungry. And so it's kind of funny, but it is, it, it's, it's significant as we think about God, fully God, fully man, in a hypostatic union. Um, he, he was a human. He is a human. Christ the human. And we don't want to in any way take away from that fact. Christ the God-man one of us. And so that's why, again, why Christmas is so good. It's why we we should be so excited about, have so much joy, because God became man, and he died for us. He bore the penalty that we deserve. So he had to be a man to do that for our place, to sacrifice for us. But then he also had to be God, because he had to bear the wrath of God to do it. So fully God, fully man, truly God, truly man. And so it's significant. It's very, very important. So we don't want to diminish his uh, humanity. I, I do think that the baby Jesus, as, as he grew as a child and got older, he probably didn't cry as much as my kids do. They cry quite a bit, right? I'm sure some of your kids, um, they get angry. They get upset, right? whatever it may be. He was probably a much quieter child. The parents of Jesus probably felt like they were the best parents of all time until they had James and, and Jude. And they realized, oh my goodness, <laughs> I don't know what to do right now. So, so it is significant. Um, and I'm not saying don't sing away in a manger, but this is something to think about. Talk to Bob if you want more info. <laughs> Bob brought up all this recently. Um, he has a very good article about it. All right, so it says that he was also the firstborn son. So one thing for the Catholic, ex-Catholics, um, he, he did have other brothers and sisters, as mentions elsewhere in the scripture. And then also the fact that he's firstborn just means he had the rights that a firstborn would have. And so he had the legal rights to reign. And again, uh, legally through Joseph, but then also firstborn of Mary. And then he says they, they lied him in a manger. And you've probably heard this before, a feeding trough. It's just a place for animals um, to eat food. And there was no place for him in the inn. Um, that word inn probably is more of like a, a guest room. Um, Actually, the word in is used in Luke for the Good Samaritan parable later on. And it's actually the word for in. So this is probably not an in like we would think of. And then the church history, they think he's probably in a cave with the animals. So think about all that. The God Almighty, the creator, the sustainer of the universe, 
being born in such humble circumstances. It just is incredible. He was born in obscurity. The one, the word made flesh and born in this way. And then another thing, I mean, the caves, when we'll look at it here with the shepherds, that's probably where the sheep were contained, but they were out at night. And so you have the good shepherd being born in a cave where the sheep usually stay. Just something else is very interesting to think about. So verse 8, now we have the shepherds. It says, in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. So the shepherds, just like Jesus was born in this lowly circumstance, so now we have these lowly shepherds. Um, Shepherds in those days were unskilled. They were not important. Um, It says in some other writings, um, they were not, I mean, non-biblical, but historical writings. They were not allowed to testify in court. So they were just very insignificant people. And yet, um, we do have a good view of shepherds as well. We have people like David, who was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. You have Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. So there, there's a positive view of shepherd. But in this case, the perspective of the world around them was very negative. So they were uneducated. <clears throat> it was, there was no education, no trade. They were the lowest paid. They had to violate the Sabbath to be shepherds. And God speaks to them. So it's truly incredible. So look at what happens. These, um, an angel comes. Oh yeah, and it's also by night. So again, that could indicate maybe it was a different time than December. So we're not sure though. So commentaries say both ways. So just flip a coin, I guess. I don't know. Let's say December 25th and let's we'll stick with it, right? So now something amazing happens. Verse nine, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. So suddenly that language there has its sense in Greek of suddenness. This angel comes and it, it shines. There's this glory. And literally in the Greek, they feared a great fear. They were terrified. And this is common. You think about when people face heavenly beings in the Bible, they fall down. They're afraid. It's terrifying. And that's not the case in our world today when people supposedly have visions of angels or you see the chubby little fat cherubim angel baby, you know, flying around. That's not what we see here. This is a majestic, mighty, awesome being. You see in Revelation, John sees the angel. He falls down to worship the angel. And the angel says, don't do that. Don't worship me. Don't do that. So that's what's going on here. They were filled with fear. I think we all would be as well if suddenly we were out in the night and this bright light comes and the angel speaks. It it was amazing. So verse 10, the angel said to them, fear not for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So fear not. And that's great. And he says, I bring you great news. That um, verb, I bring you great news is the word, um, same verb, same root as gospel. Evangelion is the, the the verbal form. I am um, essentially saying, I'm evangelizing to you now great news. Good news, great joy. And it says, for all people. So that the news of the gospel, uh, the Christmas story is, is a great news. It brings great joy. It should be for all people. And then he says 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. So this is again, the good news of Christmas, that as God came, that he was born, he is a savior. Let's look at these terms. So city of David, that is Bethlehem. Savior, um, Jesus actually, you know what his name means? Anyone? Savior. So Jesus is actually, the Hebrew form of that is Joshua. And then Joshua just means the God who saves. Um, I'll throw this in on the side, just a side note, Emmanuel, God with us, is in our Christmas kind of term. And then it says, Christ the Lord. So that term, he is the ruler, he is a master, he is the one with supreme authority. It also probably is pointing to Yahweh, the one who is, who has always been. Luke uses that term interchangeably throughout his gospel. And then it says Christ. So Christ the Lord. So Christ. So um, Christ wasn't Jesus' last name, like Brian Mullet, Jesus Christ. No, it was a title describing him, Christ basically means the Messiah or the anointed one, especially an anointed king. So we can trace this line for just a minute. Um, think back to the very beginning of the Bible. There's the fall, the curse, and then Genesis 3.15, he says, God says, 
I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her head. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So right there at the very beginning, there's this promise of this deliverer, of this savior. And so as you trace through the Bible, the messianic line, you see it. Start from there. He goes to Seth, then to Noah, Noah to Abraham. So we know when Abraham, he said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. And then from Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob. Jacob is renamed Israel. And then from <clears throat> Israel or Jacob, Judah. Genesis 49 says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. And then ultimately, I won't keep going through all names, but from Judah, we get David. And so um, as you think about those uh, genealogies in the Bible, that's one way that helps to make them very interesting as you're thinking about um, the messianic line, how, it trace, how you can trace it throughout the, old, the entire Old Testament. And that's why it's so significant that you have such long genealogies in Matthew and Luke. And so both cases um, in Matthew, it goes all the way back to Abraham. And in Luke, it goes all the way back to Adam, the first man who ever lived. So it's truly incredible. So let's, um, let's go back to our text. So verse uh, 12, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in the manger. <clears throat> Suddenly there was an angel, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So you have this multitude of angels. It's like a heavenly army is the kind of language described here. And you see that similar kind of language in Revelation um, where you have myriads of angels, myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive glory and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. So you see here just similar kind of language, glory to God in the highest. So in our Christmas time, are we bringing glory to God in the highest? Also, sadly, they weren't singing. So um, the angels were saying, uh, maybe they sang, we don't know, but at least here it says they said. And then it says, peace among those with whom he is pleased. So again, as we think about the Christmas message, um, we can have true peace through Christ because of God sending his son for us. It's incredible. <clears throat> now, at that time, there was such a thing called Pax Romana. And basically, it was the golden age of peace for the Roman Empire. It was a season. The things were very peaceful. But that wasn't the true peace, not the true peace we can find in Christ. Peace no matter what's happening in our lives. So the shepherds then, they go and they see the child. So look at 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. So the shepherds immediately, upon seeing this amazing sight, hearing from these angels, they go to see the child, and they find the child. And I thought we could uh, listen for a minute. I won't sing it. To uh, <laughs> in Excelsis Deo, um, shepherds, <clears throat> angels we have heard on high. So it says here, angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing over the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Gloria and excelsis Deo. That means glory to God in the highest. Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why your joyous strains prolong? What the gladsome tidings be, which inspire your heavenly songs? Come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee. Christ the Lord, the newborn king. That's a good um, Christmas song right there. So verse 17, um, they, and when they went and saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So you have here the shepherds evangelizing, sharing the good news as we all should do as well, especially this Christmas season. And it says here, Mary treasured this in her heart. So possibly uh, Luke had talked to her about this. He was trying yeah, to get firsthand testimony. And so 
as we think about their response, is this our response this Christmas? You can think about that. 21, at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So it's normal after eight days for the Jewish boy to be circumcised and named. And so then he was named Jesus. Again, the God who saves. So really, it's just an incredible story. Let's just turn for just a minute to John uh, 1. And we can get just a little contrast of this humble account. So <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> think about how humble, humbling it was to be born in the manger. To share this good news with the lowliest of them all, with the shepherds. Now notice what John 1 says. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you have there, in the beginning was. So the Word here is Jesus. So he was in the beginning. He was with God and he was God. So here a Trinitarian text. You have unity and you have distinction. He was with God, he was God. He was in the beginning with God, and notice this, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So he made all things. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So he, the source of light, the creator who made all things, who's always been, who always will be. And then verse 14, and the word became flesh, and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So as we think of the incarnation this year, let's think about our salvation. Let's think about this mighty God, this awesome God, the word becoming flesh, dwelling among us, living a perfect life, ultimately dying for us, his enemies. It's amazing. So, That is our um, call this year. Hopefully you can um, think about this, share this, share the good news. Um, Remember Christ as you celebrate Christmas. And I'm sure for all of you, you're going to have opportunities to be near family and friends, maybe those who don't know Christ. And maybe you can, again, just remind them of the message of Christmas, the message of the gospel, of the good news, of the great joy that we can have because of Christ. So let's uh, let's all stand and we'll um, finish with prayer in the psalm. Father, we are grateful for Christmas, and we do confess we can often forget about the reason for the season. <clears throat> May we not do that this year, Lord. Help us to put our focus on Christ and to be thankful. And pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.